So let's talk about EJBs. While we're not going to go into the complete nits and bits and complexity of the EJB interface, I think it's important that Servlet and JSP developers have an understanding of the overview of what EJB code is, how it works, and how you can use it in your Servlet or JSP application. Most centralized server applications require a common set of services, such as distributed computing for invoking methods across a network, distributed transaction management where you have uh, multiple databases and you need a transaction context, uh, scalability to provide multi-threading concurrent client access um, as our application becomes more successful. We need to be able to provide security, both authorization and authentication. Um, resource pooling for database connections, uh, Java class instances um, to help us with performance, and persistence management, both activation and passivation, being able to persist data. These are common services that most application servers uh, require that you provide support for. Distributed computing simplifies the development of applications that communicate with each other over a network. Obviously, programming by using low-level socket or TCP IP protocols is time-consuming and error-prone. Distributed computing avoids the direct use of IP and resembles a regular application such as C, C++, or Java application. Remote Procedure Call, or RPC technology, gives us the uh, ability to uh, remotely invoke a function of a, an application such as C on a server from a client application. Function argument and return values are implicitly transferred over a network with RPC. CORBA, EJP, and DCOM uh, applications extend this concept of remote procedure call by allowing method invocation on a specific object instance. In addition to the function argument, an object instance identifier is transferred over the network. This is actually referred to as distributed objects. We also expect that our applications can make use of distributed transactions. Any large application that is going to be scalable may need to work with data that's distributed over databases that could be located all around the world. Standard requirements, standard transaction requirements, must apply to all databases that expect to be involved in a transaction context. As a review, these transaction requirements are atomicity. All, mod all modifications made to any data should either take place or no change happens at all. Um, so the transactions are expected to be atomic. Consistency, a successful transaction transforms a database from a previously valid state to a new valid state. Isolation, changes that are made during a transaction that are made to a database are not visible to the user code. Um, they should be completely transparent. And durability, any changes that a transaction makes to a database need to survive a future planned or unplanned uh, system or media failures. Most commonly in modern systems, this is implemented using what's called two-phase commit. So most modern application servers need to have a transaction manager or a transaction manager service that can manage an entire transaction, including the orchestration of the transaction. Most scalable systems need to have a distributed security model. The system must be, ensure that a client has the rights uh, necessary to invoke uh, the remote methods on the server that's actually uh, performing the method call. The client or client code must be able to um, obtain an identity by logging in or passing the identity in and the client's identity must be implicitly transferred to the server during each method call or um, be able to be transferred or delegated 
um, to another identity as necessary. Since a method on one server can invoke another method on another server, the second server must also ensure that the original client has sufficient rights, and so the authorization model must be able to be distributed as well. The client's identity must be propagated down the call chain. This is generally referred to as delegation, and um, our systems must be able to handle a distributed security model so that there's no one single point of failure. The client's identity must make sense to all servers. This is generally done by configuring realms or domains. It must make sense to all servers that need to be involved in processing the client's original method call. So these are common services. What are EJBs? EJB is a technology, is a server-side component model that standardize, standardizes uh, most of these common services that we've just seen. Um, it provides a programming model, a component model for building distributed objects, distributed transactions, distributed security. It's a technology similar in goal as um, previous technologies such as CORBA or DCOM. EJBs, of course, are open standard. The advantages of using EJBs are some of the advantages of using any open standard or open specification. The competition between implementing vendors can mean the rapid maturation of products. We get support for a wider variety of platforms not being tied to one particular vendor. And as um, more employees can develop their skills, it becomes easier to find uh, skilled developers. Um, someone trained in software by one implementing vendor can leverage those skills to learn another vendor's software. That's pretty much the sales speech of uh, EJBs. What are the main characteristics of EJBs? These are kind of the rules of the road. Each EJB contains logic that's necessary for the business that typically operates on the business data. EJB instances are created and managed by an EJB container or the container. Attributes such as security, such as transaction, all the things that we've seen as features, uh, these can be configured at deploy time, at deployment time. So each customer is free to deploy and change the configuration characteristics when the application is deployed. Any access to EJB code is mediated by an EJB container, um, the EJB container in which the EJB is deployed. The container uses the above mentioned deployment configuration to check security, to manage transactions, to provide the context and lifecycle um, that we provide for configuration or deployment information. And as a side note, because some developers are looking into this um, entity called a composite application, an EJB can be included in what's referred to as a composite application. In other words, an application that's made up of multiple technologies um, without necessarily changing the source code or recompiling. There are specific components of an EJB architecture. So when we're talking about uh, various pieces of in the EJB, we're talking about EJB clients, in other words, the client code. Um, we're talking about the EJB jar file, which is generally what, um, what we use to package our EJB. The EJB server, sometimes also referred to as the EJB container. These terms tend to be used inter interchangeably. And then the, uh, the real, uh, meat of an EJB, the purpose of an EJB is to provide an, a business interface and an implementation class of your particular logic that's written in the EJB specification. An EJB client can be any Java application. Um, it can be a command line Java program. It can also be a servlet or a JSP. It could be another EJB that's deployed in the same 
or a different container. EJBs are very scalable. The E in EJB stands for enterprise. These are uh, beans that are designed to be deployed throughout an enterprise. A client application can be in the same or a different machine as the EJB. The client uh, code can be in the same JVM process as the EJB. Um, the, it can be in, so it can be on different machines, thus in different JVM processes. It can also be in the same JVM process as the EJB. The client code um, interacts with the EJB by interacting with the interface of the EJB. So the client uh, makes calls to the business interface in order to use the logic that's encapsulated in the EJB. Few notes about packaging EJBs, especially if you as a JSP or servlet developer are bringing um, EJBs into your application, you're developing the controller layer or the uh, presentation layer, and you need to bring these into the uh, project or your server runtime environment so that you can test your application. EJBs are generally used in the model layer. So you need to understand a little bit about the packaging of EJBs. All the classes and all the interfaces that make up a particular bean or beans are packaged into a jar file. You can have multiple EJBs packaged into one jar file. The jar file itself would contain all the components that are needed to be deployed for an application server environment. These might include, or would include, the actual Bean implementation class, the business interfaces, either local and or remote interfaces, Home interfaces, if you're uh, providing backward compatibility for EJBs of the 2.x specification, there was something called uh, home interfaces. Now they're just referred to as business interfaces. And a deployment descriptor. Just like in your servlet or uh, JSP application, we have a web deployment descriptor, web.xml. Uh, EJBs have a deployment descriptor and very specific schema for that deployment descriptor. And there may also be any other vendor-specific descriptors beyond the EJB specification. Uh, what we've seen in the first few pieces here, the first four pieces, are what are required for the EJB specification. A single jar file may contain multiple EJBs, which can be of both EJB 2.x uh, specification as well as 3.0 uh, specification EJBs. Servlets or JSPs are deployed in an application server. The application server, uh, the Java EE application server, actually contains inside of one JVM a web container and an EJB container. The web container is responsible for managing web artifacts uh, such as JSPs or servlets, and the EJB container is responsible for managing EJBs. So EJBs are actually deployed um, or installed inside of an EJB container, which is generally running inside of the application server. The EJB container manages EJBs. It manages specifically EJB instances. It manages the life cycle of EJBs, such as the creation, initialization, any destroy that needs to be done for EJBs. It uh, pools component instances for performance. It handles what's called activation and passivation for EJBs that need to be uh, serialized and handles it in such a way that it is transparent to the client or the calling code. The EJB container also invokes various callback methods in the EJB class at different stages of the EJB lifecycle. The EJB container delivers the available server services that we've already been looking at and manages them and delivers it to the beans. So the EJB container provides transaction and persistence management. It provides security management. It provides thread and workload management for the EJBs that are deployed within this container.
The EJB container then acts as an interface between the EJBs that are deployed there and the outside world. In other words, any other application or client code that's trying to access um, the logic encapsulated in the deployed EJBs. While providing support for many of the low-level services that we've come to expect, one of the most important functions is to manage data storage and retrieval for the beans. Actually, it's only one of the most important functions if that's actually what you're using EJBs to do. But it is one of the important functions to be able to manage data storage and data retrieval for the beans that are deployed within the container. To efficiently manage a large number of instances, the EJB container can take an instance out of memory and persist it. This is called passivation. When this bean is invoked again, the container creates a new instance and copies the data um, that was saved during passivation. This is generally referred to as activation. And we're emphasizing these uh, vocabulary words here because these are actually phases in the life cycle of an EJB, and the EJB container is handling these life cycle events in a, an EJB and managing it for performance. An EJB server is really a process that manages EJB containers. And so this is often referred to as the application server that happens to have an EJB container. The vocabulary seems to be used interchangeably in the industry. The application server or the EJB server is also giving us access to system services and whatever Java-related services um, that we're used to seeing in any JVM, such as a namespace that's accessible via uh, JNDI or via JNDI, the Java naming and directory interface. So as I mentioned, the terms EJB server and EJB container are often used interchangeably. Specifically, I know they're used interchangeably and uh, it drives me nuts, but uh, specifically the term EJB server an application server or web application server um, is generally the same thing. Web application server or application server, or Java EE application server, has an EJB container in it. It's one of the services that are provided. Internally, the EJB container can utilize any of the services that are provided by the application server or the EJB server. The EJB specification, however, assumes that the EJB container and server are the same vendor. So you don't have to worry about different implementations. There are three different types of EJBs designed to do three different things. There are session beans for encapsulating non-persistent data associated with a particular task or session. For example, withdraw a transaction for a particular client. And so just like the name implies, session beans are EJBs that manage sessions. Message-driven beans are a relatively new type of EJB uh, new to EJB 2.0 specification designed to create EJBs that easily work with asynchronous messaging systems. Entity beans are supported for backward compatibility. The entity beans are really the um, main beans that most EJB developers worked with, or the main type of beans that most EJB developers worked with. These were designed to encapsulate and are designed to encapsulate persistent business data, uh, data that is stored and accessed through a data source, and the business methods that get associated to um, manipulate the data that's encapsulated in an entity bean. So a little more detail about these. Session beans. A session bean gives us conversational state, um, conversational state that's generally not persistent and will not survive a server restart or server failure. There are actually two types of session bean. One is stateless, where instances are shared among multiple users, and then there's stateful, where instances of a session uh, bean are specific to individual users. So where you have state data that is unique to users, um, then stateful beans are what you want to use. Stateless, where you have state information that can be shared 
among multiple users. Uh, state less tends to perform obviously a lot better. State full, you have more session bean instances being created depending on um, the number of users as the number of users scales up. Session beans also manage the activation and the passivation of beans handled uh, within the session bean API. Activation and passivation on session beans is uh, provided by the container simply to m manage performance pooling of these instances of session beans. So for performance reasons, um, the system may decide to passivate beans and activate beans um, as the number of users uh, grows and the system needs to manage the performance of an overall pool of these instances. Entity beans. Entity beans are used to represent uh, commonly databases, um, but some type of persistent data. Most commonly, their fields are mapped to actually fields in a relational database. The persistent state of an entity bean is defined in one of two ways. Um, there's a flag that can be set, and the actual way that the entity bean is developed is either a container managed persistence bean or a CMP bean. This is optimal. System administrators prefer that all e entity EJBs be CMP beans because this allows them to configure the EJB container to manage the access for persistence, in other words, the reads from and writes to, particularly the writes to a database. There is also uh, BMP beans. A lot of customers don't like the support for BMP beans. Just as the name says, bean managed persistence, the bean actually contains the code that's uh, to store and retrieve data from the database through the data source. So if the system administrator needs to change the structure of the database, a bean managed persistence bean is going to be more brittle than a container managed persistence bean. Um, so keep that in mind. We don't go into the details of entity beans as they're still supported primarily uh, for backward compatibility. And as we're going forward in the EJB APIs and the EJB specification, um, it's not recommended that we continue down this path. That's uh, just a recommendation, something to stick in your cap. Message-driven beans. Message-driven beans are a special kind of enterprise bean that work with messaging systems. The primary objective, as a matter of fact, there's only a couple of settings that you can do with a message-driven bean or MDB. The primary objective is to be able to integrate EJBs with a messaging service, not necessarily Java messaging service, but because message-driven beans are Java-based, um, we're looking at hooking into the configuration of a messaging system. The client code interacts um, with a, an EJB application for MDBs or message driven beans by using messages. MDBs are then invoked by the container when a message arrives within the messaging system. So what's in the EJB specification, particularly what um, Servlet and JSP developers need to be aware of, in my opinion? Uh, the EJB3 specification has um, basically three parts. There's the EJB core contracts and requirements. This specification is mostly for vendors who are developing the application servers that run the EJB containers. It gives us the uh, specifications for the low-level issues such as the services we saw listed that are provided by the EJB container. New in EJB 3.0, this is a particular excitement for EJB developers, except those EJB developers who spent most of their career learning the less simplified API. Uh, EJB 3.0 simplified API targeted toward developers um, and, and shows how the new EJB 3.0 architecture can reduce the complexity and 
the overhead of running EJBs. The API is significantly simplified by eliminating the need for uh, home and remote interfaces, by using annotations, and there are other features as well. Uh, trust me, the crowd was very excited with EJB 3.0. And the Java Persistence API is um, not necessarily part of the EJB specification, but it has been formalized uh, alongside of the EJB specification. And it allows EJBs to use a different pro uh, programming model as a replacement for entity beans. And that's one of the recommendations. Um, that's why we see that the recommendation has been made to stop using entity beans except for backward compatibility and go um, in the direction of incorporating the JPA into your EJB architecture to replace that model layer that was, uh, or programming model uh, layer that was necessary. So let's go take a look at creating a simple EJB application and uh, make sure we have all the working parts and we can discover how this ties into our servlet and JSP application. So let's look at the uh, all the parts of creating a simple EJB application so that we can demonstrate a simple web application connecting to and using the features of an EJB. In my workspace in Eclipse, I am going to create uh, a number of new projects. And for this uh, particular project, I don't want to see um, or work with or uh, clutter my workspace with projects that I've been working on. I actually close these projects and uh, by right-clicking on them and choosing Close Project. Now the option is Open Project. But what this does is it removes all dependencies um, and closes the project. There, It takes any problems or issues that you may have had. Those are removed from the Problems view. So I'm going to create everything from scratch, starting with a deployment entity that's necessary for JBoss to deploy an EJB application. I'm going to create an entity called an Enterprise Application Project for uh, packaging and managing the dependencies between my EJB um, modules and my web modules. So I'm going to right click and choose New and choose Project. And the type of project that I'm going to create under Java EE is an Enterprise Application Project. Okay. The name of my project is going to be uh, EJB Ear Project. And I'm putting the term Ear in there. That's Java EE Packaging Specific. It stands for Enterprise Archive, just as the overall Enterprise Application Project name. I'm using JBoss's default configuration for my configuration. And that's actually all I need to do for the Enterprise Application Project. I'm going to click Finish. And uh, there's not much in my uh, project just yet. There are no modules associated with this project. But um, I see that I have the application level deployment descriptor. And that's it. Now I want to create an EJB project that is actually associated with this enterprise application project. So from anywhere inside the Project Explorer view, I can use New. And I see the option for EJB project. That's the one I'm going to use. The name of this project will be Simple EJB Project. OK. And default configuration for JBoss. Notice the EJB module version because we're using the EJB 3.0 specification. But ear membership, in other words, please associate this project with an ear or an enterprise archive project, I need to change that from the default. I can fix it later, but it's easier to fix it in the wizards. These are productivity wizards, so we want the wizard to be able to do what it does best for us. Let's step through the screens. On the next screen, there's nothing to do uh, for Java. 
but we just want to see what um, the wizards are going to stub out for us. Notice that uh, the option to create an EJB client jar module um, to hold the client interfaces and classes, we want to leave that selected. We're going to go with the defaults um, here and everything should be good to go. Click finish. All right? We're still not there yet. We've got some errors already. Uh, the error, if you notice, is an EJB module, in other words, an EJB project, must contain uh, at least one EJB. Otherwise, why bother? Um, we'll fix that coming up here really shortly. So, uh, But this is to be expected according to the specification. Now let's create our web application our uh, web interface as the client. Um, I'm going to create a new uh, dynamic web project. It's not in my short menu. You know why? Because I have the focus on EJB. If I put the focus on ear project, notice the context menu changes uh, depending on where your focus is. This is always true in most uh, applications. So I could have gone to other, but I'll uh, choose it from the short menu, dynamic web project. The name of this project will be EJB Web App. And again, I want to add this project to the same ear project um, because the web app and the EJB application are going to be contextualized uh, within the same application context um, in this particular application. That's all I need to do. I could go through all the screens, but for right now, um, I just want to make sure that the associations between my EJB project and my web project are in uh, are associated with the enterprise application. So I'm going to click Finish. Now notice uh, when we created the EJB project, the client itself was also created. So an additional project was created as we expected when we stepped through the wizards for creating the EJB project. We want to make sure that this is where the, since the EJB project client is going to be where the bulk of our business logic is going to go, we want to make sure that the web project uh, dependency is set up uh, appropriately. So we want to make sure that our EJB project, web project has the appropriate build and run dependency features set. So I'm going to right click on the web app. I'm going to go to properties and I'm going to go to Java build path. I'm sorry, I'm going to go to Project References and make sure that um, the dependencies, and you can, uh, you can see in the screen that it's actually explaining that one project, in this case uh, our EJB web app, is dependent on or refers to simple EJB project client. You can also go to the Java build path and add uh, projects from your workspace in the build path as well to make sure that the references are uh, there for build. The project references area of the properties for the project, the project references is generally for runtime. Okay, so we've got both of those set and um, we should be good to go. All right, now it's time to create our EJB. Okay, without too much fanfare, we're going to create our EJB. In our simple EJB project, and it's going to be a stateless uh, EJB so that we can see this uh, working, we're going to right click and choose New and choose Session Bean. And notice the tool is actually noting uh, 3.x, right? Because you said you were going to do a 3.x configuration. And yes, I am. So, um, and anything else if I wanted to provide backward compatibility. Most of it would have to be done manually, but the wizards are picking up what is necessary for creating an EJB 3.0 session bean. So the wizards step me through. I, I should package my Java code um, 
uh, appropriately. So I'm going to create a Java package right here in the wizard Oops, uh, for simple stateless as my package. And the class name will be uh, greeting. All we want to see is the behavior of an EJB from a web application. The state type we want to keep as stateless. We want to create a remote interface, but we don't want a local interface. What this does in the wizards, uh, once we click finish, is the wizard's going to generate, literally what it says, it's going to generate the remote interface for this particular EJB and not generate the local interface. So we're done with this. We click finish. Okay, and the Java editor opens um, for a greeting.java. This is our bean code. Okay, um, if I were to expand the simple EJB project, notice that the uh, Java code is down under a, a reference called EJB module. Notice the use of the annotation to make this a stateless bean. This means that we don't necessarily need a deployment descriptor because we're using the new EJB 3.0 annotation feature to actually designate or annotate in our code that this particular class is for a stateless session bean. The class implements an interface called greeting remote, which is obviously our EJB's remote interface. Any methods that our client code needs to uh, invoke have to be declared and implemented in this particular class. So where is this uh, actual remote code? Where is greeting remote? Because of the associations we chose in the wizards, our actual remote code is in the client code. So we see our greeting remote Java. Go ahead and open this up. Notice it is actually annotated as well with an annotation for app remote. Notice that this is an interface. It's not a class. So we're going to uh, define a method in this interface. Inside the interface, very simple method, we're going to extend this interface with our business method, um, public string say hello, right, in standard Java interface implementations. As soon as I save this, I get an error back on my greeting Java because my greeting Java implements uh, greeting remote and it says we have a problem. Uh, greeting remote has an inherited abstract method that has to provide an implementation. So now we're going to provide the implementation. Uh, we'll let the tool do it for us, okay, by clicking on the quick fix and we have an option for add unimplemented methods. And I'll choose that and notice that I get a skeleton for say hello um, annotated with override and returning null. So it's simply skeleton code, uh, but the tool is picking up what it is that we want to do here. We don't want to return null. That's not very um, business necessary. We, of course, have to return uh, hello world. Okay, so we're going to return literally a string hello world. That's our whole business method is uh, returning a string. But it gives us a simple um, chance. We have to put exclamation. It's very exciting. Um, it, what's exciting about this is how easy the API for EJBs now is. Okay, so once I save this and compile it, my uh, compilation errors are removed because I've implemented the interface. Now, for JSP and servlet developers, uh, that's really just for EJB developers, what we just did um, in creating our EJB application. Now what we want to do is look at our, uh, we want to leverage our servlet and JSP skills to create a simple servlet that now calls an EJB 
via its remote interface. Okay, so in my EJB web application, I'm going to right click and choose New Servlet. I will package it for organization purposes um, and we'll just uh, call it simple servlet, uh, the package is simple.servlet and the name of the servlet, oops, look at me, typos today, my focus in the wrong place, my focus on the keyboard, uh, the name of the class will be simple servlet, right, and the package is simple.servlet, that's all I'm going to do. It's going to actually extend HTTP servlet, which is what I expect. And in the interest of testing, what I'm going to do is override the do get method or uh, provide an actual meaningful implementation, the do get method, so that we can see it respond in simple tests to an HTTP request. In do get, I'm going to actually, you know, unlearn everything I just learned about a model view controller architecture and actually use a servlet to write out a response. Obviously, uh, we can build on this using JSPs or JSF, but right now we're going to do everything contained within the servlet code itself. From the response, I want to set content type to text HTML and get a, a handle to the print writer, right? So um, I'm going to use the print writer object. Can't resolve the type. I've got a problem with can't resolve the type, so I'll fix that in just a second. I'm going to instantiate a print writer object by using, again, the response and calling uh, get writer um, on which returns a print writer. So that's very helpful. A very quick control shift O to organize imports and it takes care of my uh, type resolution by importing java.io.printwriter. Okay. Now I want to do a lookup to a an instance name for my greeting interface. From my do get, I'm going to use greeting the greeting remote interface and create a local instance called greeting and instantiate it with from greeting remote casting to greeting remote. I'm going to do a context lookup. for a named object called greeting bean. Now, I haven't actually instantiated the context object, so I'm going to do that right above and create a context object called ctx. I'm using an object called ctx that's not been properly instantiated, and I'm going to instantiate it using the server's uh, namespace by making a call to in new initial context. So I'm calling the constructor for initial context. And I've got some problems with the uh, import statements again. It doesn't know what context is. It doesn't know what initial context is. It doesn't know what greeting remote is. So control shift O, it uh, asked me to resolve context because that's only one of the issues I have. But notice it found greeting remote. Um, unhandled exception on initial context. Obviously, um, initial context says, you know, we've got some problems here. We're going to fix it in just a second. Um, so hang on here. I'm going to add a little more code before we fix the um, uh, unhandled exception error. So what I want to do is do a, a write out to the print writer, something very simple, just put out a message that is actually, I know, coming from the EJB. So I'm going to um, create a little string instance uh, called greet 
and from greeting, right, which is in the greeting remote interface, and the tool is already picking it up, I want to call say hello. And whatever the return value is, and remember our return value is just a string, will be assigned to greet. And so I will print that out from my do get. So um, out dot println the oops the EJB says sounds like a children's story. The EJB says greet, right? Um, so that's all I'm going to print out in my servlet. Now I still have a problem with unhandled exceptions. Um, even if I save, I still have a problem with unhandled exceptions. Um, Eclipse has a nice little tool in the Java editor that allows you to select your code and with a quick fix, right click on the code, get away from the uh, uh, help menu, and choose surround with try catch block and it automatically um, picks up that your method is you know you, that you're going to have to handle at least naming exception um, if I had multiple exceptions that the I'm doing calls to methods that uh, possibly throw multiple exceptions that little feature will pick them all up and list them out for you um, I think that's uh, helpful because I'm always writing empty catch box for one thing which is you know not exactly best practice. So our web interface, our quote unquote web interface is very simply implemented in our do get method. However, our do get method is making a remote call to an EJB on our system. At this point, we should be able to deploy and run the whole thing. Okay, I want to double check my server. My server has nothing published to it yet. So what I'm going to do is add my enterprise application, one project, add it, and all the associated modules will be added and published to that server. Before we see this, I want you to be able to see one thing in the ear project deployment descriptor if I open this up, notice this grew as modules were made available as we associated our web project and our EJB project with the enterprise application. These got automatically associated to so the properties of the enterprise application and its associations or contained uh, libraries were actually being updated as we were associating them in the wizards. So back to our server, I'm going to choose uh, add remove, I'm going to add my enterprise project, I'm going to click finish. Obviously it needs to publish at this point and the server is stopped. So I um, can run the servlet and let publishing happen at the same time, that's fine. Um, I can also right click on the server while it's not running and do a publish so that JBoss has a chance to deploy my enterprise application and I get a chance to see if there are any pieces missing to my application. So I should, um, if, uh, if my uh, stars are aligned, I should see build successful, which I have. So the deployment, the Java EE deployment in JBoss has already done its thing to make sure that all my artifacts are in place, all these running parts are in place. Now it's time to see if we can actually run our application. And we're going to run our application by testing our servlet, the same way we always test servlets. I can right click and choose run as, run on server. And what I expect is I have to wait for the server to start up uh, because it wasn't started at the time. But what I would expect is a uh, browser And we got an error. So we want to look at the server console to see if we can investigate what our error actually is. If we double click on the console tab, uh, we see the Java stack trace and sure enough, name not found exception, greeting bean not bound. That's exactly the exception we were handling um, in our try catch block. So if we go back um, and we look 
at our actual uh, code, we should be able to find um, where it is our error is. In our servlet, we handled a naming exception, name not found exception. But where is it that um, we've really gotten into a problem? Let's look at our greeting code. And sure enough, um, we created an EJB that implements greeting remote. We annotated it as stateless using the at stateless uh, implementation. In earlier versions of JSP, in order to configure an instance of this bean with the name that our servlet is expecting, which is greeting bean, um, we would have to configure JNDI resources, data sources, all, uh, all kinds of uh, stuff would have to be done in configuring this uh, bean. With the stateless annotation, we can actually in, uh, extend this and create and uh, configure an attribute of the stateless annotation using the parentheses and using an attribute called mapped name. Now, there's a number of these attributes, and, and obviously, um, it's outside the scope to investigate every one of them. But map name is one of those that gives us a, a way to quickly um, map in the JNDI namespace, create a mapping for something called greeting bean. And because it's part of this annotation, it applies to our very exciting EJB. OK? So if I save this, Probably on my server, it's going to ask me to republish, and it does. So I'll go ahead and publish, but not restart the server. So hopefully, it's going to undeploy. When I run my application, it's going to redeploy uh, my EJB application. So I'm watching the console, and probably right above this, uh, where it's trying to redeploy my application, it undeployed my application and you know I could go and check that but I'm anxious to see if actually name not found exception was one of those rare exceptions that actually made sense for the uh, in troubleshooting uh, my problem so I've actually created that name that the system was looking for when it threw the name not found exception and the application was uh, undeployed and redeployed I can double check on my server and sure enough um, it added and it's binding the following entries into uh, the global JNDI and it redeployed my application. Okay. So let's hope we don't have to restart the server. So we'll go to our servlet, right click, run as, run on server. And do we still have the error? Yes, we do. Now, well, do we? Maybe not. Maybe we're just not waiting for this uh, servlet. Let's try it again. Hey! Just had to uh, press enter on the URL, and the EJB is responding. So we resolved the name not found exception. That's uh, uh, one of the features of EJBs, is making them easier to develop. But you have to understand what's uh, what was previously necessary in multiple configuration files is now very easily accomplished with some uh, simple annotations and attributes at the class level, at the method level, all of that. So what we did as Servlet and JSP developers is we created a simple Servlet that did something very simple, but it did it by making a remote call to a remote interface. And that remote interface happened to be an EJB interface, and the EJB method that was executed was actually a method called say hello. So that hopefully gives you an idea of how to work with EJBs. The nits and bits of the EJB API itself is not as important to Servlet and JSP developers as it is for Servlet and JSP developers to understand how to interact from your Servlet code, how to interact with uh, an EJB application.